another opportunity to come into your house and to worship you and to love you and to give you the honor that is due to you, Lord. And we pray this morning, God, that this word would go forth into our hearts, into our spirit, because I believe, God, you designed it for this moment, and we pray for your blessings in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'd like to speak to you on this subject. One of the closest friends of Jesus, God. One of the closest friends of Jesus, God. This is a message to the remnant church. This is a last day message for those that want to serve God and to learn some of the concepts that God is trying to teach the last day church. In John chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible said, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Mar Martha. And it was Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Jesus often fellowshiped in this house, and he esteemed Lazarus very highly as a close friend. In John 11:3, it says, Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, Behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Mary and Martha sent for Jesus, for they knew where he was. It's always important to stay close to friends and to be able to contact them when necessary. They sent a special messenger because they were concerned for their brother who was afflicted. I want you to note four things that need to be observed in this verse. Number one, they knew the location of Jesus. That's right. Number two, they trusted to tell him their troubles. Number three, they believed in him as a friend. And number four, they were waiting for an answer. When Jesus received the news, that this sickness, he said, this sickness is not unto death. Three observations need to be made here. Number one, sometimes the things that befall us, we think is our death. Hmm. Number two, we sometimes equate afflictions with the end. And number three, and then we say, how can God ever fix this situation? I'm sure you've said that. Amen. I know I have. Also note that Jesus said that this sickness was but for the glory of God. Impossible situations for us are opportunities for God to demonstrate his power in our behalf. Impossible situations bring forth the power, the mercy, and the favor of God. If he healed Lazarus immediately, nothing would be new. If he raised him quickly from the dead, nothing would be new. Now four days dead, which we'll learn later in this chapter, beyond human reasoning, an impossible case, that would be something new. Can you say amen? amen. Jesus waits to come. In Luke, uh, John chapter 11, verse 5, Now Jesus loved Ma Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Please note the following. Jesus loves us and sometimes delays or defers his coming to us that he might try us and test our faith and our trust in him. He delays that death may conquer, that he may receive the glory and honor by reversing it. Sometimes God allows things to die. Sometimes he allows your dreams and your hopes and your, your vision to die. And we wonder why God allows that. He does allow it, except the corn of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abideth alone. Praise the Lord. Oh. Hallelujah. Oh. He wants to receive the glory, praise God, by reversing the situation by extraordinary means in extraordinary situations. Praise the Lord. He allows impossible situations to be created or allowed that we might call upon him, that we might trust him, that we might believe him and yield to him. He made no haste to go to Lazarus' tomb. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.1, 
To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Amen. Amen. Verse 7 says this. Then after that he saith to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. Which means he was there before. Jesus comes on the scene during the worst time when all hope is lost. Jesus elected to go to Judea again, even though it put him in personal danger. He knew the Jews already tried to kill him before. In John chapter 10, verse 31, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Well, what happened? Well, Jesus went anyhow. When he did go, when did he go? When Mary and Martha were brought to their extremity. That's when he comes. A lot of times we want him to come immediately. Spiritual microwave age. Come on, God, I pray. Where are you? What are you doing? I'm not understanding this. All hope was lost in Israel when Ezekiel prophesied in Ezekiel 37. Then he said unto me, Son of man, God is speaking to Ezekiel. And he says, These bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. The Jewish people lost hope. Like a lot of people in America have lost hope. Listen to what Ezekiel the prophet was told. He said, Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, I will bring you out of captivity, that means, and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land, praise God. It happened in 1948, it began. And then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it, and performed it, saith the Lord. Amen. God wants to speak to the last day church, Amen. and give the last day church hope, praise God. Amen. People are losing hope, they're on the ledge, huh. they're ready to jump, they're ready to jump ship, some of them have shipwrecked their faith. Jesus told us in, and his disciples in John 11 and 7, he said, let us go. Let us go to Jerusalem. Let us face Judea. Let us face the situation. He was going to go back to Judea in the midst of danger. He was not afraid to face adversity. We need to face our Judea and get help with it. What is your present Judea? Ask yourself, what is it that's facing you? What is it that's staring you down? What is it that's the giant or Goliath in your life? He's bringing the disciples unto the same danger. Christ never brings his people into any peril, but he accompanies them in it. Amen. He doesn't forsake us. He goes with us. Yeah. Praise God. This even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we're not alone. He said in verse 8, his disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? What was happening here? The disciples were, remind, were reminding Jesus of the danger. He's going to Judea again. What they were doing was they were trying to create a stumbling block to faith through fear. That's right. Don't go, Lord. Don't go. They try to stone you. They try to kill you. He will go with you if you let him. Amen. Psalm 23, I'm not going to read it. You know it. His disciples were saying, I don't know about going to Judea. It doesn't sound good to us. How many times when God starts to plan our life and we look at it and we say, well, that doesn't sound too good to me. God says, well, it's good to me because I'm the creator and I'm leading you and guiding you by my spirit if you want to go. Praise the Lord. By saying this, oh Lord, don't go to Judea. They were distrusting Christ's keeping power. The last day church cannot do that. We must trust the keeping power of God. They were admitting a secret fear of suffering themselves. Right. We're going to suffer. The Bible says this. that They were admitting a secret fear. Faith says go. Let us. Let us expose ourselves even in danger and declare our faith openly to God. People are backing up. Pulpits are backing up. Churches are backing up. They're compromising. They're falling for all this nonsense that the world is trying to jam down their throats. It's not of God. It's anti-biblical. It's anti-Christ. Right. But we're adopting the ways of the world. Here's Christ's answer to their little speech in verse 9. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. Jesus is saying, Let us go. We must move. 
We must march on. We must go forward. Jesus is saying this to us. We must go because we are called by God. Because it's God's will. There is no hesitation walking securely in God's promises. Mm. A man with God's light will not get lost. I said a man with God's light will not get lost. He will not stumble at the task and assignment to head. He will find his way. Jesus said this in verse 10. But if a man walk in the light, he stumbleth. But for there, because there's no light in him, if he walks in the night. Jesus gave his answer by saying, Man's life is a day-by-day -day situation that's divided into stages or opportunities to do something for God where God will get the glory. Your life is in segments every day. I try to live my life from 6 a.m. to 12 noon, from 12 noon to 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. to 12 midnight. I try to live my life in three sectors. And I try to say to myself, okay, what do I want to accomplish from 6 to 12, from 12 to 6, and 6 to 12? And I set goals in my mind usually. And I try to accomplish those goals by the end of the day. I hear what I'm saying. Life is a day-by-day -day process. This is what Jesus is saying to us. Each day not only brings opportunities, but it brings the comfort and satisfaction when we walk in the way of the Lord and we walk in the light of God. Amen. That's the satisfaction. Some people get satisfaction from their job. That can just take you so far. Sometimes we get satisfaction from relationships. That can take you so far. Sometimes we get satisfaction from children, but that can take you so far. The ultimate satisfaction is our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Praise God. He will provide the light if we walk in Him. Amen. If we walk in Him, He will provide the light. If we don't walk with Him, we will stumble and yield to temptation. Jesus encouraged us to go all the way with Him and fear no evil. Amen. He said in verse 11, These things said He, and after that He saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleeping. He's talking to the disciples now. But he says, but I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest and sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. He clarified it. He's gone. He's not breathing. My close friend died. That's what he told the disciples. And he said this in verse 15. And I am glad for your sakes, listen to what Jesus is saying, that I was not there to the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, this is doubting Thomas now. Look what Thomas is saying. Want to turn around for this young man. Then Thomas said, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples. He said, let us also go that we may die with him. You remember it. In the upper room there, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm only going to believe if I can touch his wounds. And Jesus allowed that to happen. And then Thomas believed. When Jesus spoke of Lazarus as our friend, he was speaking of friendship. Friendship. He was speaking of fellowship. And he was speaking of a faithfulness to each other. It's a loyalty. And the last day church will experience that. The remnant church will experience that friendship. We'll experience that fellowship. And we'll experience that faithfulness to one another. It's called loyalty. You'll know who your brother and sister is. Amen. You will identify them by your spirit. You will know who's in your camp. You will know who's in your sheepfold. You will know who will cover your back in any instance. When Thomas said in verse 16, let us also go, he was given the following message. Number one, a readiness to die with Christ. Follow me, Jesus said. Are you willing, are we willing, no matter what the cost? Number two, a desire to help his fellow disciples to do the same. If they stone him, let them stone us. Mm. Number three, in difficult times, we should encourage each other to go all the way with Christ. Amen. There's going to be times in your life when you're going to stumble. There's going to be times in your life when you're going to fall down. There's going to be times in your life when you begin to lose some hope. There's going to be times in your life when you think it's the end. That's the job of a brother or sister in the Lord. That's the job of friendship, fellowship, and faithfulness to one another. It's to pick up your brother or your sister and take them along the way with you. Amen. 
It's a journey. It's a journey. No man is an island that lives by himself. We're connected. That's why we're called the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. Verse 17 says this, Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Four days. Four days. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 <laughs> furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Mary and Martha to comfort them concerning their brother. They were popular people. They were known. These were people that were respected in the community. And people came to re, uh, pay their respects and to comfort them. But what did Jesus find when he came? He found three things. Number one, he found death. Number two, he found grief. And number three, he found helplessness, which is the feeling, I can't do anything to change this situation. All hope is gone. Think about that. Think about that for a moment. I can't do anything to change this situation. All hope is gone. A lot of people have lost that hope and they've taken their lives, unfortunately. It's a sad place to be in. It shouldn't happen. It should never happen. Praise the Lord. Martha, in verse 20, meets Jesus. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. I have to go find him. I have to go meet him. But Mary sat still in the house. Mary went and met Jesus. We must see Jesus coming toward us no matter what the problem, Amen. no matter what the situation. And we must see him coming in mercy and coming in comfort. That's the way he comes. We should go forth to meet him by faith, with hope and prayer to meet him. He's always walking toward us, and he's always walking toward the church. Amen. He's never forsaken the church. And he's never forsaken an individual that wanted to walk in the light of God. Amen. Martha's discourse to Jesus in verse 21. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. That shows great faith that Martha had. If you had been here, he wouldn't have died. But I know, and here's great faith, that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Amen. Amen. So what is a woman of faith? She's in grief. She's in sorrow. Martha had faith no matter what the situation with her brother. Jesus would do something. She believed he would do something because he would inquire of his father. And we must believe that in this last day, church. We must believe that Jesus will do something if he inquires and we know he will inquire of our father. Amen. He's not going to let us in a ditch. No way. He's not going to drop us off on the side of the road and say you're on your own, son or daughter. Jesus replies with hope. In verse 23, he said, Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. But Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. This is a woman of faith. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Martha understood that. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Verse 27, she said unto him, Yea, Lord. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. <laughs> and when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly saying, The Master is come and call it for thee. Jesus is inquiring. He says, well, where's Mary? I'm talking to you, Martha, but where's Mary? I want to talk to her also. She's your sister. She's my friend also. The Bible says, as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. Then the Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, they followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. She was going to meet Jesus. She was going to meet Jesus. Sometimes when we think we're at the end, instead of thinking of going to the grave, we have to go meet Jesus. Amen. Come on now. Sometimes when we're brought to our extremity and we think this is the end and it's over, there's no more hope, there's, no, there's nothing left in the tank. Don't go to the grave, praise God. 
Go to Jesus. Amen. And so in verse 32, then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying unto him, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. Well, Jesus heard that message before. And when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, he's looking at her. And the Jews also weeping which came with her. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Jesus, listen to this carefully. Jesus groaned and was troubled when he saw Mary crying, falling down at his feet. Here's a woman that's beside herself right now. And she's looking at the master, at Jesus. Aren't we troubled when we see the destruction and the devastation the enemy is inflicting upon people? Yes. Right. Yes. Should be. Jesus is affected by what he sees you experience. He's deeply moved in his spirit by the trials and tribulations of your life. His goal is to bring life to where the enemy has brought death. His compassion is rooted in the heart of the Father, who reminds us in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What's God saying? He said unto Mary, he said, he said Where have you laid him? Where is the body of Lazarus? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus asked the same question to us. This morning, he says, where have you laid him? What? What have we done with one another? That's right. Amen. What have we done with one another? Have we hidden the bodies of our brothers and sisters? Hmm. Have we hidden them? What are we doing with those we live with? Do we play games out of sight, out of mind, because we don't really know what to do with these people and their problems? Have we become apathetic toward our own situation and have no empathy for the situation and circumstances of others? When you lose hope in your own life, you have no hope for someone else. Right, right. When you don't think God can fix your situation, you can't believe you can fix someone else's. Right. Have we just become a body that occupies a seat, that goes to work, goes to bed, that goes to sleep, that eats at the table, that drinks a coffee? Is that what we've become? Just a body? A man puts on his britches and he walks out there, the dead among the living. Mm -hmm. A woman puts up her makeup and makes her hair nice and she looks pretty, but she's the dead among the living. Think about this for a moment. Jesus weeps over us just being a body and not living as he created us to live. That's right. He weeps when he looks upon us and we're not living to our fullest potential. So many just exist. They are apathetic. They have no enthusiasm. They're lazy in spirit, always wondering how things could have been, should have been, could have, would have, should have. we got to get off that train. That's right. There's a new train pulling into the depot, friend. Come on. Amen. This is the first day of the rest of your life. Amen. Quit eating peanut butter and jelly. Eat something different for a change. Praise God. Break the routine. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So many have resigned themselves from life, having a few pleasures here and there, and that usually turns out to be vices, addictions, and sin. They're stuck in their own tomb, and no one seems to be looking for them. We must find each other, for we are our, our brother's keeper. We must look for the dead. Not out of sight, out of mind. We must look for the dead. Verse 35, Jesus wept. He's weeping. Oh, what a Savior who cares about a dead man. Do you think he cares for you any less? Do you think he hasn't wept for you? Do you think he's not weeping now? Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. That's friendship. <clears throat> That's friendship. That's loyalty. Behold how 
he loved you? Do you think he loved Lazarus more than he loves you this morning? Jesus weeps at any hint of death in our life. Any hint of death in our life. Behold how he loves you. It's hard to fathom. He went to the cross for us that we might have eternal life. His love for us is eternal and everlasting. We can't lose sight of this great sacrifice that was made for us and for our families. He weeps over any hint of death in our life. In verse 37, it says, and, and some of them said, Could not this man, oh, here we go, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused that, that even this man should not have died? Oh, here's the blame game now. Could not God have prevented this? That's right. That's what they said. Could not God have stopped this? They were indicting Jesus. Well, what kind of friend is this? Hold on, people, and you'll find out what kind of friend this is. This is the blame game used by people to comfort themselves in their own tombs. It's God's fault. He could have done something different. And they lay in their tomb, and they ask someone to put a big stone against it so they can't come out of their death. They live there, some of them for the rest of their life, and they get buried in that same tomb. Let us blame God. No. We can't blame God with our questions. Could not God have prevented this death, they were saying? If God loved Lazarus so much, why did he allow this to happen? Why did Jesus allow Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, to suffer such sorrow? Why does God allow any situation? He should be able to prevent such things from happening. That's what they were saying. But maybe he's waiting on you. Maybe we've twisted it a little different than we're supposed to. Maybe he's waiting on you. But better than that, maybe he's waiting on other Christians to help you. Hmm. Oh. Looking for the dead bodies. Looking for those that are struggling. Looking for those that need a conversation. Looking for those that need a fellowship. Not fair words, not nonsense. Something deep from in the heart. Intent, purpose. I love you. I care about you. How are you doing? I saw a program last night. And this doctor is with a patient. And the patient says to the doctor, how are you doing? And the doctor replied and said, hmm, that's different. I'm usually asking people that question. How are you doing? It's a simple phrase. It's a simple question. We're such in a hurry. Because a lot of times we want to deal with other people's issues. Because we say, I've got my own. You have no idea what I'm going through. You know, sometimes, if we get outside of ourselves and touch the life of another human being, well, God will solve your issue quicker than you can think. Well, what's God saying here? We, we say, why hasn't God come to heal my problems and my hurts? How come he, he allows me to stay stuck in the mud? Perhaps he's waiting for you to make a spiritual move for yourself and your family. And perhaps he's trying to call on someone else to come and aid you and help you. It's called a body. You know what God resents? Pride. I got this. I don't need your help. What are you saying? Don't you see the pride in that statement? What are you saying? That you can stand by yourself? You don't need anyone's help? You don't need anyone to reach out to you? Are you that strong? Is your name Jesus? Do you walk on water? That's the way people are. They resent the fact that someone wants to come into their life and help them. When that's what we're supposed to do by Scripture, provoking one another unto love and to good works. But we reject that. Why do we do that? Why do we do reject friendship? Why do people stay alone? Why, why do we stay like hermits, like, like we're a monk somewhere in a monastery, afraid to 
let someone know who you are because, oh, maybe if they find out who I am, they might not like me? That's not your issue. That will be theirs because if they're a friend, they're going to like you, whatever, because we all have issues. We all have inconsistencies. We all have incongruities. We all have our weirdness. If they're your friend, they will say, okay, you're weird, I'm weird, put two weirds together, and we got two weirds to help each other. But what do we do? We stay away. It's like we've gone to the courts, to the judge, and have a stay away order from our brothers and sisters in Christ. (laughs) Think about that for a moment. Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself. Listen to what it says here, groaning again in himself, coming to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Notice what the scripture says here. It indicates that Jesus, again, groaning, coming to the grave. He must have stepped away and then returned to the grave. He must have stepped away. Listen, sometimes we must step away from the fire, praise God, to see the devastation. Sometimes we must step away from the fire to see the devastation. Jesus wants to visit the dead among the living. He's looking for a man or a woman that he can resurrect spiritually. He's looking for someone he can empower with the Holy Spirit who would be willing to visit the dead among the living. Step away from your situation for a moment to get a better perspective about your problem. You know, sometimes you've got to step away and say, wait a minute, what am I dealing with here? Sometimes you have to walk away from a situation. Not that you're abandoning it, but you're gaining a better perspective. And sometimes you have to inquire of someone else and say, hey, I, I don't have a handle on this and I don't have the answer. Maybe you can help me. Think about that for a moment. Sometimes you have to step away before you can solve the problem. What did Jesus say? He said in verse 39, take away the stone. Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh. He hath been dead four days. Four days. I told you in the beginning of the sermon, if Jesus healed him instantly, it would be something new. If he raised him quickly from the dead, it wouldn't be something new. He already did that. This is new. This man's dead four days. And you know, four days, that's, that's a long time. Yeah. What's God saying? <laughs> Take away the stone. What does the stone signify? It signifies obstacles. Stumbling blocks. Sometimes rebellion, <clears throat> resentment, hatred, bitterness. Take away the stone means to lift the barriers. You know the lid on the garbage pail? Sometimes you've got to open it up and empty it. Come on. Come on. Stay with me here. What keeps us from even getting going sometimes? What keeps us? Is it despair? Past hurt? Sickness? Relationships that didn't work out? Or apathy? Some people can't get to the place to ask for help and for the stone to be taken away. They stay behind the stone. In a tomb, dead. The truth of the matter is that you might need someone's help to take away the stone that sits in front of your tomb. Because you don't have the strength at this moment to move it. Think about it. You might need someone else's help. It's okay to need someone else's help. Because pride is something that God hates. He hates it. Pride goes before destruction and a Holy Spirit before a fall. Don't think you're so strong that you don't need someone else's help or fellowship or friendship. This is the last day church. This is the last day movement in the earth. This is the remnant church that is going to learn to trust one another and learn from one another and help one another. Praise God. You must believe the stone can be moved, number one. And this doesn't have to be a forever stone. Diamonds are a forever stone. 
every woman should have a gun. And maybe two. Because that's right. But the stone in front of our tomb is not forever. You know that. Because there's been many stones in front of your tomb through the years that God came and moved. And other Christians came to help you move it because they loved you and cared about you and didn't let you die in that tomb and stink for four days. This condition will only lead to a loss of hope and eventually it will turn into despair, which is death if we stay in that tomb. Staying behind the stone and living in the cave of death will only stick it up for you and for others. This death among the living is more contagious than any disease because it affects not only the body, but also your soul and your spirit. It's a spiritual cancer. Notice in the scripture, Jesus commands the people to take away the stone. Remove the stone. He could have done that. He could have summoned a legion of angels to move that stone. That was a huge stone. It was a boulder. That thing probably weighed a few tons. What is he saying? He commands the people to move the stone. We must help each other remove the stone that blocks the exit from us coming out. That blocks us in our future in Christ. That blocks us so that we could praise God, see the kingdom of God. Some people choose to remain in that tomb. Some people choose to stay there and die while they're living. They eat, they're breathing. They go about their daily chores, but you've seen them in the stores. They talk about the zombie movies. Now that people have taken off their masks, for the most part, you see some zombies. People have just been clobbered. They're walking around in the days. They're walking around in the store like, wow. There's no glow. There's no light. They've been mesmerized. They've been like sort of hypnotized into despair. They remain in the same situation if they had a mask on and they were in quarantine somewhere. Scared of life. Fearful of life. Jesus said unto her, he said, if thou wouldst believe, thou shalt see the glory of God. If we believe, we'll see the glory of God in each other. What is the glory of God? What is it? It's the ability and the power of God to do miracles and make a difference. I'm looking for you to make a difference in my life. As you look to me to make a difference in your life, not because I have abilities or you have it. It's because God has his ability that wants to work through us to help one another. That's the ability of God. That's the power of God. That's the virtue of Jesus. We have the glory within, praise God, given to us through the born-again experience to help bring about miracles and healings in each other through Christ. The Bible says in Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. We have it. Right. It needs to be released. Not talked about. Not having an opinion about it. But doing it. When God moves on us. So tired of theological nonsense. So tired of rhetoric that's just nonsense. No death. No spirit. No anointing. Nothing to break the yoke of bondage. Just a bunch of nonsense of words. Verbal vomit. I need something that I can hold on to. I need something with faith. I need substance. I, I, I don't need a piece of meat that's made out of beans and, and soybeans. I remember one time, years ago, the brother that used to be on, Ben Kenslow. This lady came on and she was wanting to introduce soy cookies to Ben. He's passed on. He was a good brother in the Lord. 
on the 700 Club. And Ben took one of those cookies. And you know how when you go out and eat a meal somewhere and someone asks you, how was the meal? And you say these words, it was interesting. <laughs> you know what that means, right? Yeah. It was interesting. I mean, you, you, don't, you don't want to say nothing bad about the meal. And old brother Ben, he took that soy cookie and it was like, he was too, you could just hear him saying, where's my chocolate chip cookie? Give me the real deal here. I don't want to eat soybean cookies. Give me the real deal. Give me the real deal when you help me. Give me the real faith. Give me the ability of God that's in you. Hallelujah. Let the virtue of Jesus come out of you and into me because I need healing. Come on now. We're like corpses walking around. Inferiority, afraid to step out of ourselves, afraid of the dark. Afraid to speak or have an opinion. Another one. No wonder why churches are dead. No wonder why. Because people aren't free. It took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Oh, come on. Here's the faith of Jesus. Hallelujah. And I know that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. One of the greatest sins in the church today is the sin of unbelief. Killing the churches. It's killing the ministry. What happened here? Jesus is exposing death. Take off your mask. Expose the truth to God, even to the point where it stinks. <laughs> Praise God. Even though the smell might be offensive, be honest and be healed. We hide. We hide. Oh, the masks are off for so many people. But we hide emotionally. We hide spiritually. We hide. We're so cautious. We say the right thing. We say the right thing. We pick and choose the right words. Why? I remember we, my wife had a, a friend, Vicky. She was sort of a breath of fresh air, this girl. I'll just give you two instances so you can find the flavor. If you ask Vicky sometimes how she was doing, she would say, lousy. <laughs> she worked in a hamburger place one time and my friend, Brother Roger, was the manager. And some guy ordered a hamburger. Vicky was just a good girl. And the guy got the hamburger and he said to Brother Roger, he said, Hey, Brother Roger, where's the hamburger? Vicky, I forgot. She forgot to put the hamburger on the bun. But was she a lovely Christian? Did she love God? Did she have faith? Yes, she did. She was different, but she was refreshing. Because she brought something to the table that we call openness and honesty. No hiding. <laughs> Praise God. Praise the Lord. Jesus answered Martha's concern that the body of Lazarus had been dead four days and stinketh. He has power over death. He has power. Praise God. He put death under his feet. Death is a vanquished enemy. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice. He wanted the Jewish people to hear him. The words of Christ soared through the earth into the deepest, most regions of death and despair. This is the voice that spoke the earth into existence and created all things, praise God. His voice can penetrate any person, situation, or circumstance. This is the voice that spoke to the blind, to the deaf, and to the lame. 
This is the voice that spoke to the dead body of Jairus' daughter and said in Mark chapter 5 and verse 41, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise, praise God. And the spirit that left her body, that was traveling down the car of time, heard the voice of Jesus and turned around and climbed back into that body. And that little girl came alive. Why? Because she heard the voice of Jesus. The church needs to hear the voice of Jesus once again. We need to hear the voice of Jesus in our homes, in our families, and not put him under a lid somewhere. Like we're ashamed of Christ, ashamed to read our Bible, ashamed to pray in front of our kids. Let your kids know how vulnerable you are. Let your kids know that sometimes you're in the tomb and there's a stone rolled against you. That you're not invincible. That dad can't beat up everybody in the whole world. That mom isn't always the smartest person in the whole world. Show humanity. So kids don't grow up thinking they have to be perfect. Because that's the air that people put on. I got it together. You got nothing together. People can see right through that nonsense. It's a farce. Got it together. What do you got together? There's some days I'm a puddle of water on a hot summer day and when the sun shines on it, I disappear. Come on, friends. Come on, think about this for a moment. That's right. Think about it. Some of the greatest men and women of the Bible, and in the Bible, praise God, were, were like a puddle of water on a hot summer day that disappeared. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, look at them. I lied, just sat under the tree and said, God, kill me, I'm done. That's right. Where does that leave me and you? Come on. We go around thinking, hey, God, this. What do you got? I have nothing outside of Christ. Amen. I am weak, he's strong. I have nothing. I have to decrease that he might increase in my life. That's all I've got. That's all I've got. And right now, the, the things that I have is prayer and reading the word of God. Amen. And having a spiritual conversation with a person that's spiritual. That keeps me going. You hear what I'm saying? The Bible says, he cried with a loud voice. And he that was dead came forth. Bound hand and foot with grave clothes. I had no idea what they thought Lazarus was gone. <laughs> and his face was bound with, about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto him, Loose him and let him go. He said to the people, Loose him. Jesus told Lazarus to come forth. But he told the people to loose him and let him go. David Wilkerson made it famous. Blessed, blessed are those that are the unwrappers. <laughs> Praise God. Blessed are those that would go and encourage others in their faith. Lazarus was bound hand and feet. What have we not allowed God to do with our hands? What have we not allowed God to do with our feet? We can't just do what we want or go where we want to go. Jesus commanded that not only the people remove the stone that was blocking the entrance to the grave, but now, once Lazarus had come forth, he commands them to loosen his hands, his feet, and the mouth of Lazarus so that he can go forth for a season to do the work of God. Let me close. This is a close friend of Jesus. This is a home that he found comfort in. Fellowship. Loyalty. Faith. We have to ask ourselves some questions as we close. What do we do with our hands? Yeah. What do you do with your hands? Where do you go with your feet? Would you take Jesus' name? Who you speak to? Who you speak to will keep that stone from blocking your way and keep you from being wrapped in mummy clothes as you try to work for Jesus. You have to be careful of people that will imprison you. That's right. You have to be careful of people that will enclose you in their structure, in their thought, in their philosophy, who will make you doubt Christ in your life, who will make you doubt your born-again experience and the baptism of the Holy Ghost in your life. There's always someone that wants to rain on your parade. Don't close your umbrella for them. Keep your umbrella up. It's the umbrella of God that bounces their nonsense like raindrops off your umbrella away from you. Hear what I'm saying this morning as I close. 
Praise God. Jesus went where he felt the pulse and the heartbeat of his father. We have to get back to that. We have to get back to the leading of the Lord, the leading of the Holy Spirit. We have to get back to that. We have to get back to listening and hearing the voice of God. So many people make decisions outside of God, and they think God will bless them. We must make decisions in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. We must ask God a simple question. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Whatever it might be concerning your life, God gives a science as he gave an assignment to Jesus to come and to die on the cross and to rise on the third day. God gave Noah an assignment. A huge assignment to build a boat that no one else believed in. <laughs> Except his family. Eight people. There was millions. They didn't think it was going to rain. People don't think Jesus is coming. That's right. People have closed their doors to the church. Are you serious? We're the healing center of the community. We should be the lighthouse that people look toward, whether they come or not, that there's hope. That there's still some people that will dock in the door of a church and say, we still believe. We're not done. We're not dead. And we refuse to stay in the tomb. Amen. Because we have Christ and our brothers and sisters to help us move that tree and move that stone. God gives us assignments. He gave Moses an assignment. I've thought about this. Moses is 80 years old. There's no electricity. There's no bathrooms. There's no plumbing. Moses is 80. He's been 40 years in the desert taking care of sheep. And God speaks to him, gives him a sign at the burning bush. He's tired. He's weary. He's got a lot of memories going on about what happened in Egypt. How he had to flee because he was defending a brother and an Egyptian was killed. And now God calls him to this awesome assignment. Don't you ever wonder how people lived in those days? No stoves. Well, how did they live? How did they build houses? How, how did the people that came to America, how, how did they build? They didn't have chainsaws. They didn't have modern equipment. They, they didn't have things that would, that would help them build. How was it done? That's right. They came by faith. They were given an assignment to come to a place to worship God in spirit and truth and in freedom. And they took up that mantle and they came across the ocean and many of them died. But they persevered because God gave them an assignment and God sent them. And that's why you're living how you're living today. Praise the Lord. God, what is our assignment in this last day? I want to tell you one of the very first assignments is this, is to look for the dead bodies. Look for those that are living in the tomb. Some of them are in our homes. Some of them are our friends. Some of them that used to come to church. Whatever their excuses, whatever their reasons are, they're not here. This is a search and restore mission that God is calling the last day church to. Those that will heed the call, like in the days of Noah, will get in the ark. Those that will heed the call will go through the door. Those that don't, they'll die in their own sins and they'll go to hell forever. And that's not God's fault. That's not God's fault. That's their fault. So Father, as we come to a close this morning, we thank you for this word, and I believe it's a word to the remnant church. You're speaking to us, teaching us, and telling us. This is protocol. These are some of the principles that we must live by. And we must live by faith, the faith of the Son of God that you have given to us. And Father, freely we have received, we should freely give. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity that comes into our life to help others, to give others hope, a word, a word of hope, a prayer, a cup of coffee, a glass of water, a lunch, whatever it may be, Lord. 
Assign us. Lord, to the smallest detail, whatever, to the largest detail. It doesn't matter. You get the glory no matter how small or big the assignment is. And Father, we desire, we desire that you visit the death in our own lives and remove it in the name of Jesus and send some into our life when we cannot do that because we're tired and weary. That you would send other brothers and sisters into our life and say, we're here to help you remove the stone from your tomb. There's no shame in receiving help from others. God bless those that would view this sermon or listen to it. And I pray, God, that you would instill hope, instill hope, and give hope to those in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.